Thank you. We have a vet uh, rezo to vote on in the Veterans Committee. Is it here? This is uh, my opening. The rezo is mentioned in here? Yes. Okay. Uh, but is it in my opening statement? Do you know? Oh. Okay. All right. That's fine. Okay. Good afternoon. I am Council Member Eric Ulrich, and I am the Chair of the Veterans Committee, New York City Council Veterans Committee. I would like to thank my co-chair today, Robert Cornegi, for uh, co-chairing this important hearing. He is the Chair of the Committee on Small Business and for holding this hearing with us today. And thank those who are in attendance uh, at today's hearing. Before I begin with uh, my opening statement, or proceed with my opening statement, I'd like to ask for a moment of silence uh, to uh, remember the seven American sailors who were recently killed in that crash uh, aboard um, uh, that Navy ship um, who lost their lives. And um, ask for just a few moments if we can remember them. Thank you. This afternoon's hearing will focus on veteran entrepreneurship and veteran employment in New York City and the ways in which we as a city can promote and support veteran-owned businesses and help veterans secure employment and jobs in our city. We will also be voting on a resolution that establishes June 22nd as Veterans Tribute and Advocacy Day in New York City which was sponsored by Council Member Eugene, the former chair of this committee. And hearing a package of bills sponsored by the chair of the Small Business Committee, Robert Carnegie, in relation to small businesses. Veterans have a long history of returning home from their service and starting their own business. Almost 50% 50, almost 50 of World War II veterans owned and operated their own businesses after leaving military service. In recent years, however, the percentage of veteran-owned businesses has declined. As of 2013, only 4.8 percent of new entrepreneurs were veterans. The city provides programs and support for veteran-owned small businesses, but veterans may be unaware of these programs, or in some instances, uh, there may be other hurdles to veteran entrepreneurship or getting a business up and running. In addition to veteran entrepreneurship, today's hearing will also focus on the general theme of veteran employment throughout the five boroughs, which continues to be a challenge in the city. Unemployment rates for veterans in Brooklyn, Queens, and Manhattan are higher than the unemployment rate for the overall population or the civilian population in those uh, counties. In fact, many veterans report that finding a job is the greatest challenge in transitioning to civilian life, and veterans can often face stigma and discrimination from employers as a result of their military service. To that end, I am pleased to report that on Monday, yesterday, the Civil Rights Committee passed Intro 1259A, sponsored by Councilmember Jumani Williams and the Public Advocate, which seeks to amend the New York City Human Rights Law to prohibit discrimination on the basis of uniform service. Discrimination against veterans occurs most notably in the areas of employment and housing accommodation. This important legislation will provide veterans with legal recourse to challenge discrimination in housing and employment and other local level uh, issues and allow them another avenue to obtain relief when their rights are violated or when they feel that they are being discriminated against. Our hope is that this hearing will help the committees understand the different programs and support available to veterans in the city who are interested in starting their own businesses and understand the barriers that exist to veteran entrepreneurship and to try to break down those barriers. This hearing will also help us understand the obstacles to veteran employment and how the city can help better support veterans with their employment needs. I would like to thank the committee staff, committee counsel Caitlin Fahey, policy analyst Michael Kurtz, the financial analyst Zachary Harris, and my legislative director Mary Prentice for their work in making this in, uh, hearing possible. Uh, and I'd also like to recognize the members of the committee who are joining us, and then I'll turn it over to the chair of the Small Business Committee. Uh, but the members of the Veterans Committee who are here, uh, Joe Borelli from Staten Island, uh, 
Paul Vallone from Queens, and uh, that's it for now. But I'm going to turn it over to the chair of the Small Business Committee, Councilmember Cornegy, who will uh, recognize the members of that committee who have joined us and also read an opening statement. Thank you, Chair Ulrich. So good afternoon. I'm Councilmember Robert Cornegy, and I'm the chair of the Committee on Small Business. I'd like to thank Chair Ulrich of the Veterans Committee for holding this hearing jointly with us and all of you for attending our hearing today. We'll be hearing a package of bills that I'm, support, I'm sponsoring in order to support small businesses and build the New York City workforce, including Intro 1509, a local law that would require the Commission of Small Business Services to post business tools online, Intro 1511, which would require the Commission of Small Business Services to prepare and disseminate a, sm a state of small business survey, and propose Intro 1510A, which would require the Commissioner of Small Business Services to create a comprehensive workforce development plan based on the results of the state of small business survey. We'll also be holding an oversight hearing on the issue of veteran entrepreneurship, which was mentioned by Chair Ulrich, with a focus on the ways in which we can promote and renew the proud tradition. Small businesses are the lifeblood of the city. Not only do we have more small businesses than any other city in the country, but nine out of every 10 small businesses in New York metropolitan area has fewer than 20 employees. And two out of every three companies in New York City employs less than five individuals. However, as we all know, mom and pop businesses in the city must often navigate complicated city regulations and pour over city websites to find the information they need in order to bring their products and services to market. Today's hearing is another step in our ongoing efforts to improve the climate for local businesses. Each of the bills that we consider today will allow businesses to engage in the capacity building work that allows them to grow. Posting online business tools that they otherwise might not have access to, such as accounting, record keeping and bookkeeping services, can make it easier for local businesses to run and grow their businesses more quickly and easily than, otherwise, than they otherwise would. Additionally, a well-designed citywide survey of small businesses and a workforce development plan based on the results of that survey would give us both a clear picture of the needs of our small businesses and a roadmap for how the city can, pro can create a pipeline of highly skilled individuals who can act as force multipliers for tomorrow's entrepreneurs. I'm looking forward to hearing testimony about these bills and how they can be developed to assist the small business community in New York City. I also intend to understand how we can better assist veterans during the job search while starting a small business or while growing to, while working to grow that business. Finally, I'd like to thank the committee staff, Council Nicole Labine, Policy Analyst Michael Kurtz, Finance Analyst John Russell, my Chief of Staff Stephanie Zinnerman, and my Small Business Liaison Keegan Sheehan. Finally, I'd like to uh, thank the Council members who are from the committee who are here. Uh, Valone from Queens is here. Oh, Carlos from Chaka from Brooklyn. And I'm sure more will join us. Oh, I'm sorry, Karen? Did you just curse out loud? Karen Kozlowicz from Queens, Peter Kuhl from Queens. Oh, Joe Borelli. He already mentioned Joe Borelli. I didn't mention you, but. Reuben Wills from the Great Borough of Queens. Thank you. <laughs> Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony today and to answer council member questions honestly? Yes. Thank you. So you can, you can begin. Ladies first, of course. on now. All right, there we go. Good afternoon, Chair Cornegy, um, Chair Ulrich, when he's back, and members of the Committees on Small Business and Veterans. My name is Rachel Vantosh, and I am the Deputy Commissioner of Business Services at the New York City Department of Small Business Services, or as we like to say, SBS. <laughs> At SBS, we aim to unlock economic potential and create economic security for all New Yorkers by connecting them to quality jobs, building stronger businesses, and fostering vibrant neighborhoods across the five boroughs. Today, I'm pleased to testify on intros 1509, 1510, and 1511, as well as share information about the work we do to support our veterans. On a personal note, our conversation today is especially important to me. Both my grandfathers, 
were veterans who lived in New York City and returned here after their service. When they returned home, my grandfathers were able to find jobs and start businesses after serving their country. And that's how they supported my family for the rest of their lives. Um, one was fortunate enough to attend a watchmaking school through support from the government, allowing him to open a small jewelry shop on Canal Street that he operated for 40 years at the same location. Just as past veterans have returned home with the necessary support to succeed, my hope for every veteran who returns home to New York City is that they have every possible opportunity to build a strong foundation for themselves and their families. Veteran success in employment and entrepreneurship is very important to SBS and aligns with our vision of creating equity of access to opportunity in New York City. At the beginning of this administration, SBS, in partnership with the Mayor's Office of Veteran Services, now the Department of Veteran Services, released an extensive report on SBS services that support and empower veterans. This includes priority one, a tailored set of services for veterans and their spouses available through our network of 20 Workforce One Career Centers, where SBS also provides recruitment services, industry knowledge, and skill building workshops to match candidates to jobs. SBS has 12 dedicated veteran specialists, most of whom are veterans themselves, at Workforce One centers across the city in every borough. These veteran specialists work as a team to recruit veterans to Workforce One, prioritize veterans for staff appointments and all career training and job connection services. Specialists also deliver one-on-one -on -one career development support, which includes military to civilian resume translation and interview assistance. We work closely with DVS and even have a DVS outreach coordinator placed at our downtown Brooklyn location. In fiscal year 16, Priority One connected more than 1,300 veterans and their spouses to employment. We're on track to serve as many veterans this year and has seen a 5% increase as in wages compared to last year. Workforce One is committed to serving our veterans and is continually making every effort to ensure our clients have access to good paying jobs in fast growing industries. As I know from my own family history, small businesses provide opportunities for veterans to achieve economic security and create jobs. Through seven small business solution, seven NYC business solution centers across the five boroughs, SBS provides free accessible services to local businesses, including how to secure financing and access city benefits. <coughs> Understanding the unique barriers faced by veteran entrepreneurs SBS offers specialized courses tailored to veterans. For veterans who are looking to start their own business, we offer 10 steps to starting a business for veterans, which builds upon our existing course, but also incorporates content for veteran entrepreneurs. For veterans that are ready to follow through with their business plan, SBS offers a 40-hour course specifically for them. The curriculum, called Fast Track, is a global entrepreneur education program that equips aspiring and established entrepreneurs with business skills and insights, tools, and peer networks to start and grow successful businesses. To date, we've reached over 50 veterans through these classes. As the Department of Veteran Services continue to grow, we are eager to collaborate and connect the veterans community to these programs and our other services. We would also welcome the opportunity to work with council to spread the word about these resources to your constituents. I will now discuss each of the bills on today's agenda beginning with intro 1511, which would require SBS to prepare and disseminate a state of small business survey. As the Deputy Commissioner for Business Services, I am committed to ensuring we're providing services that directly address the needs of New York City's small business owners. We regularly receive feedback from customers who access service, services through our business solution centers. However, an empirical survey would help identify additional obstacles that slow business growth and creation. We would not only be interested in assessing workforce needs, but also other issues related to operations, infrastructure, and access to capital. However, while SBS fully supports this legislation, we don't have the necessary resources to complete this survey in a way that would produce meaningful results, and we would need some time to do the survey. Intro 1510 would require SBS to create a comprehensive workforce development plan based on the survey. Since we do not yet know the results of the survey, it would be premature to commit to developing a particular response to such, such as a comprehensive workforce development plan at this time. 
Instead, we would propose engaging with the council to discuss potential deliverables of the survey based on analysis of the results once the survey was completed. Intro 1509 would require SBS to post business tools online. While we certainly agree with the chair um, that it's critical to make business resources accessible, that's why we committed to do so through Small Business First. Since the release of the Small Business First report, SBS is working diligently with multiple agencies and businesses to launch the NYC Business Portal, a one-stop shop for businesses to access all related city resources through one portal. Recently, we launched several features on this site, including a new landing page, as well as the ability to create an account from any device so that users can access information rega regarding their licenses, permits, and inspections with agencies such as Department of Buildings, Fire, and Health, as well as pay for violations through Health. The portal also includes licensing questionnaire and incentive estimator, which allow businesses to identify the necessary licenses and permits that they need when starting a business and learn about incentive programs that they qualify for. Once the portal is complete, businesses will be able to seamlessly conduct online transactions with city agencies, including applying for or renewing licenses and permits, making payments, checking the status of application, et cetera. Moreover, business owners will be able to receive alerts about upcoming renewal deadlines. We are also working with relevant city agencies, such as Consumer Affairs, uh, Environmental Protection, Department of Finance, et cetera, to ensure that information on the site is current and accurate. Additionally, we recently created plain language startup guides for 16 industries, such as retail construction and manufacturing. While we support this legislation's goal of making business information accessible and have been trying to do so through our portal, we must mo note that it poses significant legal issues to connect commercial goods or services or to promote or endorse particular applications on city websites as required by this bill. As you can see, we do a lot for the job seekers and small businesses of New York City, but there's always more to be done. We appreciate the council's advocacy and attention to veteran employment and entrepreneurship and look forward to continuing this conversation with you. Jamal Othman will now provide brief testimony on the work of the Department of Veteran Services, after which I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon, Chair Carnegie, Chair Ulrich in spirit and members of the Committee on Veterans and Committee on Small Business. My name is Jamal Othman, and I have the privilege of serving as the Assistant Commissioner for City Employment, Education, Entrepreneurship, Events, and Engagement, it's a mouthful, of the New York City Department of Veterans Services. Thank you for the opportunity to meet and hear our testimony on Introduction 1509, 1510, 1511, and Resolution 1412, alongside my colleague, Rachel Van Tosh, Deputy Commissioner of the New York City Department of Small Business Services. In my current role, I have the responsibility of leading the department's citywide campaign to connect veterans and their families with employment opportunities, educational resources, financial services, and business opportunities. In fact, any resource they may be eligible as a result of their military service, regardless of their discharge status. As a veteran of the Marine Corps myself, I have a personal connection and vested interest in the economic prosperity of the veterans we serve, because I am one of them. The challenges of reintegrating into our communities after military service is not a one-time life event. It's a lifelong journey. And at DVS, we want to be part of that veteran's journey all along the way, including increasing access to resources to our veteran business community. DVS has always had a close working relationship with our colleagues at SBS. DVS regularly identifies veteran-friendly businesses committed to hiring veterans and ensure they are connected to SBS for consideration as a supplier of jobs to the Workforce One Career Centers. Our community outreach coordinators regularly refer and make warm handoffs to Workforce One Career Center veteran specialists. And as Rachel mentioned, DVS and SBS recently launched a collaboration where one of our outreach coordinators is hosted at a local Workforce One Center 
working alongside a veteran employment specialist. Currently, we have an outreach coordinator holding office hours at the downtown Brooklyn Workforce One site, where we have been performing warm handoffs of veteran seeking employment and workforce development opportunities. The intention is creating a concerted holistic approach to addressing the needs of New York City veterans by both DVS and SBS. With regard to the legislation being considered today, DVS supports Intro 1511, which proposes to require small business services to prepare and disseminate a state of small business services. We believe one of the biggest challenges we face as veteran service providers is not knowing what we don't know. The results of such a survey can help inform SBS and DVS to better provide tailored programs and targeted part particular unmet needs in a data-driven approach, and DVS stands ready to assist SBS in that endeavor. In relation to Intro 1510, which proposes to require small business services to formulate a comprehensive workforce development plan based on the results of the State of Small Business Survey, we concur with SBS. We believe it would be premature to identify programmatic approaches until the results of such a survey identifies gaps in services and community needs. Intro 1509 proposes to require the Commission of Small Business Services to post online business tools on their website. We also concur with SBS. In fact, DVS is currently revamping its website and planning to roll out a dedicated landing page listing tools and resources not only from SBS, but also from other federal, state, and city sources. The design and content, though, will be consistent with advice received on acceptable linking from nyc.gov and restric restrictions on endorsement of particular commercial goods and services. <clears throat> Additionally, as we previously testified, <coughs> excuse me, DVS will be launching Vet Connect NYC. It's an online portal for veterans and their families that provides a single point of access, no wrong door approach for veterans to be connected to best in class vetted public and private resources. VetConnect is in the procurement phase and we expect to launch this fall. <coughs> Finally, Resolution 1412 would formally declare the date of June 22nd, Veterans Tribute and Advocacy Day in New York City. Nearing the culmination of the Second World War on June 22nd, 1944, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt signed the Servicemen's Readjustment Act of 1944, more commonly known as the GI Bill into law. And I just may add that I am a product of the GI Bill. I went to college and graduate school on the GI Bill after separating from service, and I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for the GI Bill. This landmark piece of legislation guaranteed service member benefits to pursue education, home ownership, and vocational training, to name a few. DVS supports Resolution 1412, as this date represents a critical milestone in our nation's history in acknowledging the service and sacrifices of our veterans, as well as the stalwart efforts of our veteran advocate community, which heavily influenced the passage of the GI Bill. I want to thank you, the members of the council, and in particular, the community whose feedback we value. This concludes my testimony. I'd be delighted to take questions at this point. Before we move forward, I just want to say on behalf of myself, my family, uh, the Committee on Small Business, Mr. Altman, I thank you for your service. Thank you, And sir. I'd like you to tell your grandfathers, both of them, if they're still alive and still, and still around, that we um, appreciate uh, their service in all military endeavors. He was very excited to hear I was testifying today. <clears throat> Thank you, Co-Chair. And uh, <clears throat> I want to mention that we've been joined by Councilmember Mizell and also Cabrera, members of the Veterans Committee. Uh, they are waiting for a vote on the resolution, uh, which uh, we will take the role in just a minute. But first, we're going to hear from the sponsor of the resolution, Councilmember Eugene, who also happens to be the former chair of this committee. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. As you know, my name is Matthew Eugene, and I'm the council member representing District 40 in Brooklyn. First, I would like to thank uh, my colleagues on the Veterans Committee and the Smaller Business Committee, and especially the two chairs, council member Eric Ulrich of the Veterans Committee, and also council member Robert Carnegie 
of the Committee on Small Businesses for hearing this uh, very important resolution to declare June 22nd Veteran Tribute and Advocacy Day in New York City. Resolution 1412 proposes that that Veteran Tribute and Advocacy Day to be held on the anniversary of the day that uh, the President Franklin Delano Roosevelt signed the GI Bill of Right into Law, creating a modern system of benefit for veterans. My intention with Veteran Tribute and Advocacy Day is not only to celebrate the service and sacrifices of our veterans, but uh, to take this day as an opportunity to advocate for better resources for veterans who are returning to civilian life. Veterans of, of all ages face a wide range of challenges, health problems, mental health problems, difficulties readjusting to family and civilian life, and more. And I think it is right to take uh, the anniversary of the GI Bill to advocate for better services and resources for those who have given so much to serve our country. I would like to thank the chair, my colleague, Eric, uh, Eric Alrich, as well as all the members of the committee, all the staff, especially Michael Kurtz, and also my own staff, Ethan Tucker and Adam Odien. And I would like also to take the opportunity to thank all the veterans of all ages for what that they have done for us, for all of us, for this country, for putting their life in danger to defend our democracy and our freedom. And you made the utmost sacrifices. And I think we owe you a great deal of gratitude on behalf of everybody and on my behalf. Thank you so very much for what you have done for this country and for all of us. And God bless you and your family. And Mr. Chair, thank you very much. Thank you, Council Member uh, Eugene. I'll ask the clerk to call the roll, if we can, on the resident. Committee Clerk Matthew DeStefano, Committee on Veterans, jointly with the Committee on Small Business. Roll call vote for the Committee on Veterans on Resolution 1412. Chair Elrich. I vote aye and recommend the yes vote. Cabrera. Aye. Mizell. Yes. Ballone. Borelli. Aye. By a vote of five in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and no abstentions, the resolution is passed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, now I'm going to turn it back over to Chair Carnegie, and uh, I want to apologize for having to step out for your testimony. I'm on the Environmental Protection Committee. We were voting on a bill uh, upstairs, so I had to uh, I had to shoot up there, and I just came back down, but I'm I'm actively reading your testimony, and I'll have some very good questions in just a few minutes, but I'll let my co-chair take it from here. Thank you, Co-Chair Ulrich. Um, so I'm acutely aware that some of my colleagues have other responsibilities, so I am going to do something unprecedented and forego uh, my usual lengthy round of questioning uh, and allow my colleagues who may or may not have any questions to offer those questions now. Council Member Wills, T take your time. I'm excited. I, this has never happened before. <laughs> so, so someone gave up speaking time. And I was going to tell you a couple other chairs that should learn from this, but we're going to leave that alone. <laughs> um, good afternoon. Uh, thank you, uh, chairs, uh, for, for going that minute, because some of us do have to um, leave. I appreciate it tremendously. Um, I just had a couple of quick questions. I went over it with the uh, staff this morning. Um, in the briefing paper, it discussed the drop-off um, of the veterans that were actually becoming entrepreneurs uh, from World War II and Korean vets at 41.1%. And then in 2003, it dropped to 2.2% 2 .2 of new entrepreneurs by veterans. And in 2013, it dropped to 4.8%. Um, do we know why there's such a sharp decline? In, um, and I think the, the new, uh, it's new to me, the term that was coined is uh, 
veteran, veteranpreneurship? I, I don't have any uh, reason why that would, you have a sharp drop off. I mean, there could be multiple speculative reasons, uh, mm -hmm. but I, I honestly don't know. I mean, that. you can speculate. I mean, <laughs> it, <laughs> I, I, mean I, I don't understand it because it, it seems like with all of the new programs that we have, um, not just in New York City being the leader of it, um, thanks to the leadership of our committee chairs, small business and veterans and some other people across the state. I got to give some state folks some credit also. But um, it would seem that we would have more veterans as entrepreneurs, right? So I'm wondering why. I mean, we are in the, tech, um, the technology uh, driven economy and different things like that. So you have any speculation as to why that dropped off to better help us? Mm -hmm. I know you said you needed more resources to do certain things, but <clears throat> we need to find out why the veterans are not becoming the entrepreneurs that we wish them to be. Uh, again, I have no data to back this up. Off the top of my head, what I would say is that um, since World War II, you've been seeing a lot more veterans attend college um, and enter the, uh, the mainstream job market. That could potentially be one of the reasons. Again, I'm speculating. Okay. I um, also, I'll yes. say, I don't have answers off the top of my head, but we can certainly look into it, and we can look and see how that compares to overall rates of entrepreneurship among individuals, mm -hmm. and see if there's a disparity there, and get back to you. Have we done any work around the uh, Chambers on the Go? Is that, Chair, is that what the correct name of it is? The Chamber yeah. on the Go? Have we done, what? I'm giving you credit, you got a great program. I don't know, you late today? I don't know what's happening today with you. Um, uh, have we have we um, done anything with that particular program around um, veterans? Yeah, so through Chamber on the Go, which mm -hmm. is a great program. Thank you, Chair Carnegie. That's um, what I was trying to do. <laughs> you didn't give you a smart remark. I don't know what's happening. Um, <laughs> the Chambers are trained in all of the services that we provide, which mm -hmm. includes our services for veterans. And since we've launched that program, we've reached more than 5,000 businesses and connected nearly 1,500 of them to our services. So we think it's been very successful. And have we reached any new aspirational marks or anything with that, with the Chamber on the Go and Veteran Services, things that we would like to see or pull into Veteran Services citywide? You know, it's a good question. I think that um, we've now successfully implemented two years of the mm -hmm. service, so this mm -hmm. would be a really good point to work with our colleagues at DVS and see if there are some ways that we can make even stronger connections there. Okay, thank you. I don't want to take up more time than I should. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. That was, that was very short. I'm very uh, appreciative. Thank you. Um, do any other members of the Veterans Committee? I think Mizell and Valone had to leave. There are several other committees that are meeting simultaneously, so people are really uh, in and out on the 16th floor and here on 14. Um, I didn't get a chance to uh, listen to your testimony, but I did get a chance to read it. And uh, I want to thank you for being here representing uh, Commissioner Sutton and the agency, which we fought very hard to create. And uh, we know how important the work is that we're doing together to help veterans. I have a question about the Workforce One Centers. This came up at the hearing uh, about two years ago when we had the first hearing on veteran entrepreneurship. We had heard some um, unfortunate uh, negative feedback from some actual veterans who came that day to testify about some bad experiences that they had at Workforce One Centers. And I know that <clears throat> at the time, MOVA was looking into improving the customer service and accessibility of uh, the veterans liaison uh, that is assigned to the Workforce One Center in each borough. And I'm just wondering if you have uh, an update on that. Is DVS actively involved in training or supervising any of those workers, even though they technically work for SBS? And in the Workforce One Centers, are they accountable in any way to the new department or to Commissioner Sutton? Maybe you can shed some light on that. Thank you for the question, uh, Chair Ulrich. So as you know, we, we uh, one of our uh, committed milestones when the agency was created was to establish citywide presence. And I'm um, proud to announce that uh, just before Memorial Day, we accomplished that, and we have satellite sites in all five boroughs, and we have outreach coordinators in each borough. Each outreach coordinator in each respective borough works with the veteran specialist in that respective borough with the veteran uh, employment specialist. 
So you, you, have, uh, you have a close working relationship with e each of these individuals. I'm gonna use the Brooklyn site as an example um, where we currently have uh, one of our art outreach coordinators embedded in the Workforce One site. And what we're finding is that um, when you have a veteran uh, employment specialist and, and an outreach coordinator that you know, specializes on assisting veterans with a whole host of resources and they're a couple of cubicles away from each other, great things happen. And um, what we're seeing is, um, you, know, you know, people like to say warm handoffs, you know, this, these, are, these, are, these are hot of the oven, you know, sort of transfers that are happening. Veterans right there could get immediate access to, uh, to resources and services. So what you've seen since the creation of DVS and since the establishment of the borough site is a much closer relationship between the Workforce One sites where there's a veteran employment specialist and our outreach coordinators. That, I think that's very important, Chair, and uh, you know, for veterans who felt that they were getting the runaround prior to this uh, <coughs> marriage, if you will, between the two agencies, I think it's very important that they work to closely together uh, to make sure that when referrals are made that uh, they are made in kind and that they are um, obviously follow through somehow. There are some people that I, I know Workforce One centers can't help, you know, that there, there are other issues involved. We won't get into those issues today, but for the ones that we can, I think it's really important, especially in light of the fact that the unemployment rate among veterans in parts of the city like Brooklyn and Queens are higher than the civilian population. That's very disturbing. Uh, to me. How, are we helping uh, ho formerly homeless veterans? I know we help them with getting permanent housing. The administration has done uh, a yeoman's job in actually eliminating chronic veterans homelessness uh, in the city, but are we helping them with job training? Are we getting them jobs? It's nice that we're getting them into apartments and out of the shelter system, but what are we doing for those veterans uh, to get them jobs? Do we have an update on that, uh, DVS or, or uh, SBS? Anybody want to talk on that? I'd be happy to add something to that. Um, so, so, so as you mentioned, as you mentioned, the city and 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 DVS have, have uh, made some great strides in reducing uh, veteran among the uh, homelessness among veterans. Um, we have on staff an active care coordinator because we recognize that it's just not about making sure that veterans are housed. We want to ensure that we have low recidivism rates. Um, so that's number one. I think number two is we're now in a place uh, through our outreach coordinators and through our connection through SBS to, again, ensure that uh, formerly homeless veterans have access and get front of the line services at SBS Workforce One sites. Mm -hmm. um, additionally, um, you know, we explore all employment avenues for all veterans, in particular for homeless veterans. So there may be a service provider that we have partnered with that we uh, that may uh, may take on a case with one of our homeless formerly homeless veterans. Uh, additionally, um, the city, the city of New York is um, many people may not know this is actually the largest employer of veterans in New York City. We have about roughly eight to ten thousand uh, veterans and reservists working for the city of New York. Um, and public service has historically uh, uh, been an avenue for many separating um, uh, service members. And we wanna make sure that New York City continues that tradition. So we're also exploring avenues working with DCAS Civil Service to ensure that veterans uh, who get uh, special consideration, uh, you know, civil service credit, um, have access to those benefits. Uh, including homeless veterans. And I will add that through the Workforce One system, we do, and Priority One, we do try to meet veterans where they're at. So if they're not ready to be connected to employment, we will connect them to wraparound services, we will work with them on building their resume, interview skills, we will work to connect them with appropriate trainings, and they receive first priority, first place in the line for any of those services. <coughs> So there's no no wrong door you could come that's, in. That's really great news, and I think we've come a long way from that first hearing where we were very concerned about how veterans were being treated in Workforce One centers. My last question, then I'll, I'm going to turn it back over to my co-chair, is involving the set-aside. 
Uh, you know, Governor Cuomo announced a couple of years ago, I think it's a 6% set aside for procurement uh, for state contracts for veterans. Mm -hmm. And I believe that the city of New York, uh, the administration was opposed to that idea of doing it on the city level at the time because we weren't actually sure what percentage of procurements was already being done uh, with veterans. And so the city said that they were going to add a question, I believe, to the GSA or something. It was a... The pay information Thank portal. you. Yeah, yeah, the... the, the uh, yeah. PIP. PIP, thank you. <laughs> PIP, I was way off, but anyway. Yeah, but, uh, no, GSA is close. GSA yeah. is close. It's a federal thing. Anyway, but uh, so have we... We've added that now to the PIP? Yeah. Do we have any data on that? Uh, how many veterans are actually already doing business with the city? Uh, the, the raw number of percentage, is there a goal? Is it above a certain threshold? Can you share some of that information? Um, I can share certainly some of that information. Um, so as you mentioned, about two years ago, we did some work in thinking around would it make sense to have a goals program for veterans. And you know, we've been working closely with the newly created mayor's office of MWBE and DVS on thinking through whether that makes sense at this point. We did you know, allow for a check mark sort of in PIP around this, and so far, only 200, actually a little over 200 businesses have signed up. Um, so it's something we will continue to explore and talk through. Um, and I think that you know we're happy to work with DVS and the mayor's office of MWBE on any ways of expanding procurement opportunities for veterans. And we haven't waited to have a program in order to provide them a whole range of capacity building services in order for them to access city, state, and federal contracts. Um, so while I think it's important, it's certainly not the only way that we can support veteran business owners in contracting with the city. Thank you again for your testimony and, of course, for all your good work helping veterans in the city. Thank you, Co-Chair. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Co-Chair Ulrich. Um, I just wanted to ask, you know, there's some anecdotal information that suggests that uh, veterans uh, the transferable skills of uh, service are more uh, suited for entrepreneurship than, than actual jobs. What has been your experience with that anecdotal kind of suggestion? Um, do, you, do you support that idea? Do you think that it, you know? I'm just curious as to what uh, your expertise lends to, to that notion. I, I, in working with veterans for, uh, for the last 20 years, um, what, I, what I've seen is a mix, right? I've seen the entrepreneurial spirit, and that could be demonstrated in, a, in a multiple different ways. It could be by starting a business, or it could be by uh, showing a certain type of initiative at, at, the, at the workplace. Um, I like to think that I'm entrepreneurial at work. Um, so I've seen sort of a mix there. The, the spirit is there, and it's just, displayed in different ways. So I, I asked that because um, I kind of got a sense that, that that may be what you're thinking, and I wanted to make sure that we're supporting the notion uh, that there may be some non-traditional opportunities for service members transitioning that we should be um, not only exploring, but um, having resources ready available to yes. assist in that area. So it's, you know, it's kind of to some degree uncharted waters yeah. as, as a mass idea. Um, and there are just so many technologically technolo technology driven industries that support service members um, and and their transferable skills that I don't want to I don't want to miss the boat on any opportunity uh, that could be supportive of service members. So I'd like to continue to have that conversation and see how we as a council and how the small business committee in particular can be supportive of a notion of uh, a, a, a greater emphasis on entrepreneurship. I will say for the programs that we run that are tailored to entrepreneurs, what we see is that um, most veterans come in with you know, a strong commitment to excellence and attention to detail and very high levels of strategic planning skills, which are all extremely applicable to entrepreneurship. So a lot of the tailoring of the curriculum that we run for businesses talk about how to translate that skill that you get in the military to planning a business. So I think your words uh, certainly make sense and resonate with our experience as well. Thank you. So, uh, Senator, I'm, I'm going to say Senator Perkins. Councilman <laughs> Perkins, uh, do you have any questions? I'd like to. 
So I'm going to uh, move to um, the legislative portion of today at this time, and at the risk of blowing an opportunity to be expedient in a hearing, I do have some a few questions. So I, I know that. Um, so my first question is on intro 1509. In, in the Small Business First Report, which was released in 2014, your first recommendation was to create a comprehensive online business portal, which you, which you referenced in your testimony. Uh, what's the timeline for a fully functional o online rollout of Small Business First, uh, one, one that includes the comprehensive business portal? Um, so we have continued to make updates to the portal. You know, I like to think that our work is never done in fully rolling something like that out. Um, as I mentioned, we have a new interface. We have new abilities for individuals to access their unique permit and licensing information. They now have the ability to conduct transactions online with um, agencies like the Department of Health and really have one place where they can go to get information from all of the different agencies. So we will continue to roll out new versions of that um, as information becomes available. But we and certainly made good progress so far. Secondly, I'll, 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 so I don't know if I heard you say that there's currently online business tools available for small businesses via the portal, the portal right now, today. So I think um, for, for that bill, we certainly support it in spirit. I think the problem is with how it's written. There's some issues um, from our legal counsel around recommending specific commercial tools like QuickBooks and linking to them on the site. So while we support the idea of information about how to use tools like that, information on city services, that direct connection to specific commercial products would be difficult for us. So is the difficulty in choosing specific products to highlight or is it in, because if there's an array and everybody, you know, and you can point, I'm just curious as to where mm -hmm. the problem is, is it in you know, saying QuickBooks and saying something else, or is it in um, listing the, you know, what's available to a small business in, it, in its entirety? Right. I think it's recommending specific products, and I'm happy to talk about ways we might be able to tweak the legislation so that it meets shared purposes, because we certainly think collecting in one place all the tools and resources available to businesses is a shared goal of ours. So ultimately, you should know that I'd love to see uh, Chamber on the Go have a, a vast array of services available, mm -hmm. like you know, uh, a, a, a small um, either bookkeeping or something that actually goes out mm -hmm. and is able to support businesses and kind of a pool, uh, a way of doing things. So <laughs> this is like kind of the first step towards I think doing you know uh, vir virtually doing it and then mm -hmm. literally doing it to su to support small business. So. Great, we should talk about that more. Uh, and so the second is on uh, proposed intro 1510A. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think a reasonable number of businesses to survey would be, and how long do you anticipate the administration of the survey would take? I think that it would really depend on what scope we ended up going with um, and our desire to get a broad representative range of business owners in the city, which I think we would want. I'm not a statistician, so I would de defer to somebody with expertise on that, to the exact number of businesses surveyed. Um, given what potential costs might be and timeline, it could take, I, I think, up to a year maybe to roll something out, um, but I, I wouldn't anticipate much more than that. Uh, does, does SBS currently have the capacity, I think you asked, answered this, uh, in, in almost an ask of resources, but I'm going to ask the question anyway. Does SBS currently have the capacity to create and disseminate this survey? I think if we wanted to do a large-scale comprehensive survey, again, pending the exact scope, we would need additional resources. Um, I think you should know and you should uh, articulate to Greg that it's never my, I'm sorry, Commissioner Bishop, mm -hmm. it is never my intention to inundate this office, which is doing tremendous work, mm -hmm. uh, and I, I don't want you to think that I'm somewhere just thinking up crazy stuff for SBS to do. Uh, most of most of the things that I've attempted to implement have been informed by uh, meeting with business mm -hmm. owners in groups, um, uh, in you know, 
so it's, it's not it's not me just trying to <laughs> come up with things. We support 1509. We think a comp broad, comprehensive survey of business owners could really benefit our work. So I thank you for proposing. And, and do you have any idea kind of uh, broadly what information would be most helpful to gather from small businesses with, with an intent on helping to build capacity? Because like, that's my intent, not just information for the sake of information, mm -hmm. but to move us in a direction that we could truly be supportive of businesses. And I, I believe I heard you say meeting, or that was you who said meeting either veterans or businesses where they are mm -hmm. is, is, the, is the total intent of this legislation and I think anything that's come out of this committee. So. Absolutely, and the vision, sort of mission of SBS is equity of access to opportunity for everybody in the city. So I think what we would want to look at are the unique barriers, the unique barriers that businesses face across the city in accessing capital, in building business skills, and things like that. Thank you, and then, and then lastly for me on intro 1511, how do you anticipate that the upcoming jobs plan creating at least 100,000 new middle class jobs that pay at least 50,000 per year will incorporate workforce development? I think there are some specific recommendations in the report around new ways to do workforce development like in parenthesis NYC in the report. So um, hopefully it will move us you know, further along in exploring new ways to support people in accessing employment in the city. So I've been struggling because I, I found um, a statistic, and, and, and I keep citing it, and not, I gotta get the, so, the source again, but it was a reliable, trust me, it was a reliable source. That said, um, if we as a city help build capacity in every small business mm -hmm. across the city of New York in an effort that they could hire one more person, we would actually decrease unemployment by 50% in, in under five years. Um, to me, that's the answer to their, everything, right? I'm like, you know, new workforce development, which is a great direction to go. There's this idea that if we supported the small business as they are, mm -hmm. and they could just hire one more employee, it would be better than any goals that we're attempting to set in any other area. I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on that. And, and it's hard for you to answer having only Rob Cornegy as the cited source. <laughs> uh, I promise next time I will have the, the, the cited source, which is a credible source. Uh, but it's just something that's kind of stuck in my mind that I don't want to be off base. I don't want to. I don't want to leave the council mm -hmm. having understood that that to be a necessity and not acted towards it. I mean, I think that at SBS we of course believe that small businesses are strong job creators in the city and are the backbone of the economy. I mean, through Workforce One, um, the majority of businesses that we serve are small and we provide them with free recruitment services from a, a wide range of candidates. There are about 125,000 people every year that come through Workforce One. We also support them in training their teams and their staff through programs like customized training and on-the-job training. So we have a robust set of services, I think, to support small businesses in helping to find and talent and build their talent base. And through all of the work we do through business solutions and the variety of other programs that we offer, we work to grow business owners. So I'm completely supportive of the idea that we should add a job to every small business in the city. So I want to thank you both for your testimony. And again, thank you for, thank for you. your service. Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. I want to kind of just follow up a little bit to your question because I, I, I may have misunderstood the question, but I thought if we could build the capacity of small businesses to just hire one more person, the unemployment challenge would be overcome. Is that a realistic vision to implement? Is it, what might be the challenges to implementing that in terms of resources, you know, Training. I don't know what. How does that? How does that kind of a challenge get met? And what would be the obstacles or mm -hmm. dollars and cents <laughs> that might be needed to to fulfill that? So through the work that we do at SBS, we offer what I a very comprehensive set of services to small business owners. Uh, I'd say probably among one of the most comprehensive, and we work with more than 10,000 businesses every year. That's certainly Small not, businesses? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Certainly not 
every single one of them in New York City. That sounds like 10,000 potential jobs as per the question that I understood. Potentially, I think not every business owner wants to have employees. Some are very happy to be sole proprietors or otherwise in the city. Um, but I certainly think that the issues that we work to address, like access to capital and business skill building and helping uh, small businesses who are qualified access government contracts, those are all ways that we help them try to grow employment opportunities. So let's, if I may pursue this just a second more, I mm -hmm. apologize if, if, if I'm being overindulgent. But if there was a call, we, we want to hire 10,000 individuals 10,000 small businesses are going to be uh, supported towards that end. How much would that cost, the budget? What would be the budgetary cost for something like that? How would you determine the budgetary cost for something like that? I don't know if I'm able to give a budgetary cost for something like that, but I will say that the mayor did just commit to growing 100,000 new jobs over the next 10 years in certain growing sectors. Um, with investments in real estate, investments in talent, those are all ways we could think about achieving a goal like that. But in terms of small businesses, which I think is what is, is uh, it kind of attractive to me about the question, and I, I just wonder, is there a, a way to focus that question and, 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 and de develop something behind it? You, you understand what I'm trying to say? Because mm -hmm. we do have a small business agenda in, in, in our portfolio. Mm -hmm. How many Absolutely. small businesses would you say there are in, in, in this city, for instance? Um, there are nearly 200,000. So 10,000 jobs within that 200,000, is that realistic? I don't know if I'd be able to, to mm -hmm. fully answer that question in this hearing. I'd be happy to talk with you more about it offline. I think, um, you know, as the chair said, most of the businesses in New York City are small businesses. So the mayor's commitment around the jobs, uh, job creation plan and other ways are ways we're already working to pursue that goal, I think. Uh, thank you very much, Council Member, for the, for the question and, and, and for your response as well. And hopefully we can you know, work with it somehow or other, at least take a good look at it, because that sounds very promising, potentially, and it sounds very relevant. And, you know, and, in some of our communities and throughout the city. Thank you. So, so just to, to encapsulate, I think what the council member, myself, and what you're alluding to is, there, to me, it's, it's, it's a, it's a three-pronged attack. It's, it's access to capital, mm -hmm. so businesses can grow. It's access to technical assistance, which we try to do with the great work that SBS is doing, and now doing a tremendous amount of outreach with Chamber on the go. Mm -hmm. And then it's, um, it's the city's procurement and contracting portion of this uh, falling in particular communities where it didn't exist before. So there is absolutely a formula if we're committed and we have the political will to do it. And I believe that, and I believe that we do. Um, you, you've shown the commitment by the, you know, the mayor's new jobs plan. Um, SBS has worked diligently to increase MWBE participation in contracting across the city. So I think I asked the question that the ball is already rolling in, but we can we can shape it. I think not a little bit better, but but we can um, quantify what we're doing, and, and it doesn't have to be like this thing that happened during a period of time in history. We actually can can shape it a little more, and and hopefully instead of it just being an um, an organic occurrence. We can, you know, we can do a little bit of organic occurrence because it is we have new industry and new technology that's that's providing uh, more business. But we can target a little bit simultaneously. So I think that's not a far fetched number. Ten thousand is not is not a far fetched number if that's what we're saying. And it, it can be rolled into the the mayor's portfolio of of a hundred thousand jobs. But we can target it very easy. Um, I, I'm I'm in contact with small businesses every single day, and a lot of them would love access to capital, but actually the majority would love access to technical assistance, whether it's, whether it's you know, how to formulate a website or whether it is um, access to someone who could help them with their bookkeeping or record keeping. So all of these small things can cumulatively have an effect and impact on increasing um, uh, uh, jobs in the city. 
uh, but not by accident. So I don't, I don't want this to happen by accident. I want us to actually be responsible for its formation. And it sounds like you're doing a little bit of that already, but I'd like to explore uh, how we can quantify what's happening organically. I think certainly any way that we can improve our services to help businesses start and grow in the city, we'd be happy to discuss. So, so thank you. If there's no more questions, we can call the next thank panel. You. Thank, thank you. you. Karen Rouse. I am going to destroy this name. Last name is Komatsu. Yes. And Avi, Avi Lestos? Oh. Well, Avi. Avi, you write like a doctor, by the way. If you can just be prepared to um, have your testimony affirmed. Uh, please raise your right hands. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony today and to answer council member questions honestly? Thank you. So obviously, since I butchered your name the worst, uh, can you go first? Good afternoon, Chairs Carnegie, members of the of both the small business community and the veteran community. I'm Avi Luscious. I'm Director of Government Affairs and Deputy Director of the Business Solutions Center for the Chamber, Brooklyn Chamber of Commerce. Uh, with over 2,100 active members, the Brooklyn Chamber is the largest chamber in New York. We promote economic development across the borough of Brooklyn, as well as advocate on behalf of our members who are small businesses. The Brooklyn Alliance, which is a not-for-profit economic development affiliate of the Brooklyn Chamber, which works to address the needs of businesses through their business programs. The Brooklyn Chamber is generally supportive of Intro 1509, which seeks to further enhance the current accessibility and organization of <coughs> online business tools on New York City Small Businesses we Services website. We are optimistic that the Committee of New York City Small Business Services can work together to implement and enhance over time, which will create additional benefits for small businesses that utilize such online functions. We are also supportive of Intro 1511, which would initiate data collection of New York City Small Businesses services for analysis as it relates to workforce needs of small businesses, and also Intro 1510, which would help the agency to create a comprehensive workforce development plan based on the results of the said survey. In the 2016 state member issue survey, 52% of participants indicated that they plan to hire one to five new employees in 2017. So obviously, back to your c comment about hiring new employees, our small businesses are saying that they want to hire between one and five new employees. So that's definitely a, a goal that we could achieve. Uh, so I'm not going to go through the whole thing. And basically, so the, the Brooklyn is home to New York City's only remaining active duty military base, Fort Hamilton. The fort has been in existence for almost 200 years, and its economic and cultural impact of Southern Brooklyn is still significant today. We highly recommend the focus initiative between Fort Hamilton and the veteran entrepreneurs, such as what's going on at NYU, LIU, and other incubators, to work is to include, but not li be limited, to training, mentoring, technology access upon the discharge. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Hi. Um, I'm a U.S. Navy veteran. I was assigned to the Yokosuka Naval Base in Japan, where, unfortunately, that w there was a recent incident of s seven sailors. Um, there's been some discussion today about the issue of homelessness, shelters, and jobs. I'm actually in a sh shelter for veterans in the Bronx, and with regards to remarks that the mayor made on Veterans Day last year in Madison Square Park, across the street from Credit Suisse, where I used to work, um, I have a transcript of his remarks, and let me just briefly read to you uh, two key remarks he made. Quote, unquote, anyone who has a job that they're looking to fill, fill it with a veteran. Next remark, when you hire a veteran, I guarantee you you will not only be doing the right thing, you'll be doing yourself a favor because they're that good. <coughs> the problem with his remarks is these are 12 jobs with New York City government agencies I've applied for. I'm fully quali qualified for them. I haven't been granted a single interview for any of them. So the question is, how do you rectify his remarks with um, the actual practices in play? Next question is, uh, one of those jobs, well, 
one of those jobs I applied for was actually with the mayor's office as a help desk analyst, a job I previously held. I reached out to Harold Miller, who's on his staff, asking if there was anything he could do to intervene uh, to see if I could be granted an interview and then have a decision made on the merits as to whether to grant me that job or to deny it. Again, I reached out to his own staff. There was no interview. Um, so I guess the question I have for your commission is, what will your commission do to have me granted job interviews with New York City government agencies I'm fully qualified for and apply for? Um, let me move on to the ne next question. Um, with regards to that oath that we all took when we enlisted in the military to protect something called the Constitution against all enemies, both foreign and domestic, without an expiration date and without any exceptions, if um, <coughs> the mayor's head of security, Howard Redman, who's currently a defendant in a federal civil rights lawsuit, kept me out of a uh, town hall meeting on April 27th in Long Island City, if he's still on his security team, security team violating a U.S. Supreme Court decision in Wood versus Moss, as well as the New York State Open Meetings Law, again, what will your commission do to allow me to attend a public meeting where I'm essentially trying to ask these commissioners of government agencies, why am I not being granted an interview? And how can you help the 66-year-old lady in Rigo Park, who's uh, a slumlord that I previously beat in court, is trying to evict? I mean, with regards to HRA, it has its Office of, of Civil Justice that perhaps Mr. Ulrich is familiar with. I asked Stephen Banks on March 1st at the Yale Club face-to-face, -face, gave him about five to six court transcripts if he could get me legal assistance, legal representation. He told me at the time he would. He tried to get me some legal help. Problem is, he lied. That never happened. I followed up with him at numerous public events about that very question, that very issue. Again, he lied. Um, his wife is actually the supervising judge of the, the housing court citywide. So the question is, if Judge Clifton Nemhart of the Queens, Queens Housing Court was in my apartment in Queens in Jackson Heights on July 10th of 2015, while I was recording him on audio to determine whether if there was a fraudulent inspection conducted in my apartment um, when the judge was present with two court officers, I could then use that information on appeal. If those two court officers told me to shut off that audio recording in violation of a 2014 California federal court decision that basically says, if a government officer enters your residence, you have a First Amendment due process right to record those officers as long as you don't interfere, interfere with the perform, performance of their public duties, then where's the legal assistance been to let me overcome that flagrant judicial misconduct that caused me to be unlawfully evicted from my residence in Jackson Heights? Um, I should follow up on that point by, uh, it, would it would seem that Mr. Banks has a clear conflict of interest on one hand, the mandate of his agency is to try to stop or otherwise reduce evictions. On the, on the other hand, his wife is failing to supervise subordinate judges such that veterans like myself have to become homeless only because of the fact that a judge illegally pr uh, prevented me from pr uh, presenting audio recordings, video recordings in court after he initially said he would let me present those recordings, which then caused me to have absolutely no defense in that uh, litigation. Um, let me, I don't mean to dominate your time, but I'm just gonna try to be brief. Um, okay, that, okay um, with regards to the root cause of what caused me to become homeless in the first place is, there's a company I used to do business with, um, worked for five years ago uh, at Credit Suisse. It's an IT outsourcing company, it's called NTT Data. Problem is HRA, the New York State Attorney General's Office, the Department of Education, um, they all have contracts with this company. So if Credit Suisse illegally coerced me to work 50 hours per week five years ago, and I only got paid 40 hours in violation of the contract that applied, then why in the hell is HRA, all these New York City government agencies doing business with the same company I'm still waiting to be paid from? Um, I mean, if, you, if it were you, and you weren't getting your compensation for the job that you're doing week in, week out, day in, day out, that would have severe ramifications upon with regards to your ability to pay your bills. Um, so again, with regards to, there was this discussion earlier about procurement. So if New York City is procuring services from vendors that are violating labor law, that are currently a defendant in a separate um, what, uh, 
Eastern District Court case where involving both TD Bank and Entity Data, it involves a compliance manager who got into a car accident. She asked for a reasonable accommodation because they didn't grant that reasonable accommodation. She was retaliated against and terminated. So if Entity Data is a defendant in that same lawsuit, it's not related to me, basically if they're vi discriminating, if they're violating labor law, and people like myself, unfortunately that compliance manager, are at a loss because of their unlawful conduct. Again, why is the city of New York doing business with that company? Okay, Mr. Komatsu, right? Yeah. Is that correct? First of all, I want to thank you for your service. My grandfather is a Navy veteran, was, he passed away, served on the USS America. That ship has been decommissioned. Uh, but I have profound respect and admiration for our sailors, all the members of our armed services, but particularly I have a soft spot in my heart for um, for a Navy man, and my brother's a Marine, which is technically part of the Navy. I like to remind him of that. It drives him nuts sometimes, but uh, he's in Camp Pendleton right now. But uh, thank you for your service. Thank you for coming here to testify. Uh, you brought up a lot of, first of all, it takes a lot of courage to come here. It takes a lot out of your day and time to even come here and get up and say the things that you've said. So I want to thank you for that and let you know that that has not fallen on deaf ears. It sounds to me and I'm not trying to generalize your uh, remarks, but it sounds uh, like it to me that you have a number of legal issues that you need legal assistance with. And the council, um, you may be aware, uh, recently provided a significant grant to NILAG, the New York Legal Assistance Group, and also the, uh, the uh, person there is David Falcon, F-A-L-C-O-N. I can give you his contact information. I reached out to them. They refused to provide assistance. Okay. Uh, the other group that we fund is Legal Services NYC. I did that too. Did you speak to Peter Kempner? Basically. I'd like to put you in touch with him. He's actually a housing specialist. I think I reached out to him and again. Well, I, if I can, I'd like to reach out to him on your behalf. I'd okay. like to call him in advance to say you're going to hear from Mr. Komatsu and I want you to meet with him or take his call and just sort of try to sort some of these things out for him. So. I personally would be very happy to make that call so that you're not cold calling him and he doesn't say, who is this guy calling me about all these issues? I'd like to give him a, a heads up that you're going to call and if I can after the hearing get your contact information. I'm sorry to hear that you found yourself in a shelter system. I want to let you know that it can happen to anybody. Uh, people fall on hard times, they lose their jobs, things happen in life for whatever reason and uh, you're up in the Bronx. Um, in the, uh, are, are you in the, in the, uh, the with Urban Pathways, which did a bait and switch that led to me getting uh, assaulted after an, uh, an attempted assault on May 12th. I brought that to HRA's attention. They failed to act. As a result, I was diagnosed with a concussion on July uh, 2nd of last year. Well, I mean, um, I anyone, mean, do you avail yourself of the services at the VA or? Uh, they told me they can't help. They can only help with veterans. Do you have issues. bad, pay it's not my business, but do you have an honorable discharge? I'm assuming you Honorable under, under general conditions. Okay, so, uh, well, I mean, if you're not comfortable or it's not convenient for you to go to the VA, we're also big supporters of the NYU family, uh, the Langone Military uh, Clinic there. They do phenomenal work, phenomenal work and for free. I already reached out to both. They told me they can't help. Why can't they? What was I the went to the 23rd and 1st, the yeah. VA there. No, not the VA. I, that's, that's the Harbor VA. I want to send you to NYU. Right. And, I want, and I'm going to talk to Dr. Amanda but, Spray. But I don't have mental health issues. I, well, they have, other, they have a range of services there. It's not only mental health. It's not a mental health clinic exclusively. They have other types of services mm -hmm. that they provide for veterans. I would imagine that you need to see a neurologist or a specialist if you have a concussion, for instance. You don't, don't have the time. I have to deal with this litigation. Okay. Here's the thing. I want to help you get a lawyer, and I want to help you get help. Yep. Right? And I don't want you to feel like you're getting a runaround, because it sounds to me like you're very frustrated that perhaps you're not able to get anywhere. But what about this issue of employment? I mean, right The issue now, of employment, I, I'm a little... Um, Disappointed that the administration's folks left, but I think uh, some people have stayed. Because with regards to that particular issue, yeah, I'm getting I've been getting public assistance benefits from HRA, and although I applied to HRA and other city agencies for jobs that would provide an annual salary of over sixty thousand a year, I'm getting these notices in the mail from HRA saying, "Hey, do you want to go to this place where you can earn eleven dollars an hour?" Right. That's nothing close to like sixty thousand yeah. a year. Well, I mean, uh, sixty thousand dollars a year are 
they're certainly bountiful in a big city like New York, but they're, you know, they're very hard to navigate. So what I would like you to do is just, uh, first sure. of all, I want to get your information sure. after this test, but after well, your test. One of the last questions I really had for you guys was, is there anything that you guys can do to try to propose legislation that would grant veterans preferential hiring as well as preferential uh, legal representation instead of having to read the news and hear about how immigrants are getting legal representation lep left and right um, while veterans have to basically sit in the back of the line? Well, we, are, we have made considerable progress with helping veterans navigate the, uh, not only the civil court uh, issues that they're having, but also the criminal court with the expansion of the veterans treatment courts to all five boroughs and getting some of those providers that we are funding to go to those monthly meetings with the judge, with the DA's office, to make sure that those veterans who do find themselves involved in the criminal justice system on that end of the courthouse, that they do have proper representation. What I'd like to do, is that, which I mentioned to you earlier, is I want to call Peter Kempner for you, and, I w and he's a wonderful guy. He's mm -hmm. a very caring, compassionate person who really goes out of his way to, to, to try to do everything he can to help veterans with a, a range of legal issues, and certainly some of the issues that you brought up fall into those categories. I'm confident that he's going to listen to you, and he's going to try to help you sort some of these things out. I, I'm not going to guarantee you a certain outcome, but I am going to guarantee you that He's not going to blow you off. You're not going to feel like you're getting to run around. With respect to the employment issues, I'm going to I'm going to punt that to the administration and hope that someone from DVS sort of works with you one on one to look at some of those specific JVN numbers, those job vacancy numbers that you've applied for on NYC.gov, to go through some of them with you and then see if any accommodations can be made. Again, I, mean, I, I can't promise that they're going to say you're hired on the spot, but I do. I, I do believe that they will do whatever they can to help cut through some of the red tape. They receive thousands and thousands right. of applications, but certainly a person with your experience and having your military service uh, attached to your resume is, is going to be very helpful. So I just, I, what I want to do is let you know that we're going to try to help you. Sure. But is there anything in the interim that you can do to, um, I guess, allow, have me allowed into this public town hall meeting in Chinatown? That's going to be tomorrow night with the mayor and you know, commissioners. You know what? I mean, if you want... So I can actually, you know, raise these concerns directly to those commissioners and the mayor. I believe that the preference in those instances... I don't know because the mayor hasn't had a town hall in my district. I've invited him. I don't know why, but I'm, that's but a joke. That's a political joke. But if his security team yeah. kept me out of the public meeting in the Bronx... Well, I think, I, I think that, to be, to be quite honest with you, and I'm the last guy to defend the mayor. You know that. Okay. But... To be fair, the preference goes for the constituents that live in those districts. That's why he's having different town halls in various council districts, because there are hundreds of people sure. that have concerns and issues in their own neighborhoods, and when the mayor comes to their neighborhood, they want to be heard too. And but there's a problem with that. Again, there was a public meeting in the Bronx Supreme Court where his own security team kept me out of the Veterans Memorial Hall. Okay. So if they're violating my First Amendment rights in the Bronx Supreme Court where they have absolutely no jurisdiction, right. then they should be able to make I, some reasonable accommodation. I can't speak to that, but what I would like to do after this hearing, if we can, please, give me your information, work with uh, the folks at DVS, and let's see what we can help you with. We may not be able to help you with everything, but I really want to see if we can sort some of these issues out. I, I reached really out to DVS previously, Nicole Bronca specifically. Didn't get help. All right. Well, but they're here today. Jamal, the, the assistant commissioner, is here. He's a, a Marine. He's honorary Navy veteran, I guess we could call them because he's Department <laughs> of the Navy. And uh, I'm just teasing him. But um, let's see if we can work through some of these issues. Okay. But I want to thank you for being here today. And any veteran that ever comes before this committee, we don't put a time limit on them, I mean, unless we have hundreds of them. We appreciate your service. And we want to help you. And for you to come here today, I think, takes a lot of courage. And I want to let you know we're going to do what we can. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Co-Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kowalski. Good afternoon. Uh, and I, I, I'd like to start my testimony by, by seconding the recommendations made by Councilman Ulrich um, to you, uh, as my brother veteran, um, that there are free legal services available for low-income New Yorkers. And we do receive um, a hiring preference in civil service posi positions in New York City and New York State. Uh, and thank you for offering this help um, to, to a fellow veteran. Um, my name is Kristen Rouse. Uh, I served for more than 20 years of combined service in the United States Army, Army Reserve, and the New York National Guard, which included three tours of duty in Afghanistan. 
I'm here today to testify on behalf of the New York City Veterans Alliance, a member-supported grassroots policy advocacy and empowerment organization serving veterans, service members, and their families across the New York metro area. I'm also the president and director of the New York City Veterans Alliance, which is a corporation registered in New York State, which te technically makes me a business entrepreneur. Um, we applaud this joint hearing for considering the needs of veteran entrepreneurs and business owners in New York City. Veteran business owners have not received significant public attention from the New York City government since 2014, when SBS and MOVA jointly produced a report concluding that there should be no focus program for veteran-owned businesses and city contracting. The report surveyed only a small pool of veteran-owned businesses, and as many of us noted at the time, the findings of that report were stunningly low, uh, even going so far as to contradict the much higher number of veteran entrepreneurs that had been counted in the 2007 uh, United States Census figures for New York City. Uh, but that report is what has stood um, since then as a bar to making veteran-owned businesses competitive for city contracts, uh, forcing veterans who seek lucrative government contracts to seek eligibility instead for federal and state contracting set-asides uh, in the absence of a, a city set-aside. Um, and uh, with, with reference to uh, the training programs offered by SBS, uh, SBS has offered that the, um, the fast track training program for veteran business owners, but we've heard from, uh, from veterans that it's offered during the daytime, uh, which makes it difficult for employed veterans to attend that, that training. Uh, and additionally, uh, outreach materials, which are currently difficult to find by navigating the DVS or SBS websites as they are today, um, simply do not inspire the confidence of veterans that the course is worth their while. Uh, veterans have instead turned to nonprofit or academic ventures or they've started their own ventures, um, like Bunker Labs or NYU Tandon's programs or the, the other programs that Avi mentioned, um, to launch and incubate their business ideas. And so we're seeing a lot of uh, a lot of proliferation and support within the the nonprofit and private sector, um, and uh, all the while veterans seeking information about the city's oldest entrepreneurial venture for veterans, street vending, uh, still have to navigate murky regulatory guidance uh, between different city and state agencies just to determine how to attain a license, let alone operate successfully. So that that information is still very difficult uh, to find uh, and clarify. Um, which is all to say that any workforce development plan or online business tools offered by New York City government must include wording and materials specific to veterans and their needs, as we've talked about here today, uh, to include eligibility for state and federal contracting set-asides that currently exist. Any small business survey must seek to capture data on both disabled and non-disabled veterans, um, which was not adequately surveyed in 2014. Um, in order that the needs of veterans uh, are, are adequately um, taken into account and addressed. Um, I'd also like to just speak briefly about Workforce One. Um, you know, the, the integration between DBS and Workforce One has been encouraging, but, uh, but we hear anecdotally from veterans that many of the positions posted uh, are, you know, earning below $15 an hour, and, uh, and it's not seen as, as veteran job seekers as uh, providing a lot of quality job opportunities. Again, that's anecdotal, and, uh, and the posts that we see coming across our vet jobs listserv um, are often of the lower wage, low skills, uh, you know, sort, and so, uh, so we encourage the city to, uh, to promote uh, higher skill, higher paying job opportunities through, um, through Workforce One and, and, and those portals. Um, and furthermore, uh, as uh, Chairman Ulrich uh, mentioned at the outset of this hearing, um, I want to take this opportunity to encourage all members of the New York City Council to support the passage of Intro 1259, uh, which does address um, you know, prohibit prohibiting discrimination against veterans in employment, importantly, uh, as well as other aspects of uh, you know, their, their life, such as housing uh, and, and so on. Um, I urge in particular uh, council members, Mizell and Cabrera, members of the Veterans Committee, to sign on as co-sponsors of 1259, which they have not done yet. Um, I also urge council member Eugene, who was present earlier, uh, who, who sponsored this wonderful resolution uh, honoring the passage of the GI Bill, we encourage him to also support 1259, which will not only honor veterans uh, and, and their benefits in words, but substantively prohibit discrimination against veterans uh, and military members in New York City. Um, this, 
this is something that will tangibly affect veterans' employment, uh, veterans' lives here in New York City. Please support 1259 and uh, take that opportunity to pass that bill this week. Um, on behalf of New York City Veterans Alliance, I thank you for this opportunity to testify. Thank you all. Uh, very briefly, allow Councilmember Perkins. He's having a Veterans Resource Fair coming up. Maybe you want to announce that date when that is. I know you you host a wonderful event every year up in Harlem. Yes. Uh, uh, a resource fair. It's a, we have a veteran that works for us. His name is Rafael Escano, and he handles this. Um, and so it's an annual event, and um, we have a task a task force. Uh, let me just double check the scheduling here. Uh, June 21st, um, from nine, starts at 9.30, and they'll be at the State Office Building in Harlem on the eighth floor. All veterans here and anywhere that can hear my voice or get any news of it, by all means, don't hesitate to join us. It's usually a pretty well attended and well appreciated event by the veterans, and so we're happy that uh, Raphael is able to provide the kind of leadership and outreach to make it so successful. If there are any other questions or concerns, you can reach me by myself, 646-279-1824. Did you just give out your personal cell phone? Yes. All right, that concludes today's uh, hearing. I want to thank the members of the Veterans Committee uh, and also the members of the Small Business Committee, of which I'm also a member, and uh, my co-chair, Robert Carnegie. Uh, this is an issue that we care very uh, deeply about, and uh, we want to help veterans uh, get jobs, help them keep the jobs that they already have, and help them train for the jobs that are going to be available in the future. So, um, and we want to thank the administration for coming and testifying and being a partner in uh, helping veterans with employment issues in New York City. So with that, I will conclude today's hearing. Thank you.